This is Keys to the Shop, episode 206, The Social and Emotional Impact of the Cafe Space, with sociologist Noah Berger. Well, hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DiFurio. I'm your host for the show. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you haven't yet subscribed to the show, I would encourage you to do that because then you'll never miss an episode. Just hit subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, also, if you have the time to leave a review on iTunes, that would be amazing as well. Now, today's episode is brought to you by people that are really helping you do better at making coffee, and that is Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is such an awesome company that puts so much effort into curating the best equipment they can find from all over the globe and then working with you to make sure you get matched up with the right equipment for your situation. So whether that's espresso machines, grinders, brewers, hot water towers, uh, even under-counter refrigeration and sinks, they have you covered on the whole spectrum of a commercial equipment that you need for your soon-to-be coffee bar or um, you know, helping you upgrade the equipment in your current bar, helping you scale to another store even. They really can work with you to get the right equipment for the job. Reach out to them, work with them, and see what I mean when I say they're the best, um, awesome people, and an awesome service for the coffee community. Check them out over at prima-coffee.com slash keys. Today's episode is also brought to you by the folks that are creating amazing plant-based beverage experiences for your customers, and that is the Pacific Barista Series. That is the line of plant-based performance beverages that are designed with a barista in mind, but not just that. They're created in concert with a ton of feedback from some of the best baristas in the world. Uh, People on the front lines in the store telling them, like, this is good or this is not good, you know, really testing the product. And when they launch something, you know it's going to be an amazing product, whether that's uh, soy, almond, coconut, rice, oat, or hemp. You can definitely count on it, taking the heat from the steaming process, creating amazing texture in your beverages. Uh, You can do latte art easily. And you can also count on it being uh, a beverage that has an amazing balance of flavor. So it's not overwhelmingly just the flavor of the uh, beverage you're using. All that is so critical for your customers. And I would really encourage you to get this in your store and try it out for yourself. Uh, Have your customers taste it. Have your baristas taste it. Uh, My feeling is that you'll probably end up getting this as a a fixture on your menu. So check them out over at pacificfoods.com. Follow the link in the show notes and uh, see what the barista series can do to help you elevate the plant-based options your customers have in your cafe. All right. So today we are diving into a uh, sociological rabbit hole when it comes to quality, authenticity, and emotional labor. Um, There are a lot of things to discuss here. We in the specialty coffee retail world have um, such an incredible impact on the industry with the messaging that we send, with our branding, um, the way that we conduct our business, how we purchase coffee, uh, the way we we represent the farmers, um, et cetera. There's so much to consider when you're opening a coffee bar and running a coffee bar. And we definitely, I think, more than ever are concerned about our impact, not just on the environment, like the earth environment, which is huge, but also our impact on our communities, you know, our social impact. And today we're going to discuss several aspects of that with somebody who has spent an incredible amount of time uh, studying the subject. We're talking today with Noah Berger who is currently a PhD student at the School of Advanced Studies in Social Sciences in Paris. She holds an MA in Cultural Anthropology from the same school, and she has spent a considerable amount of time speaking, hosting panels on, writing on this subject all around the coffee industry, and has been helping us broaden our understanding of our position in the specialty coffee world and how we affect everything around us. Um, She brings a ton of great questions to bear here in this conversation. I think the goal in this conversation is not only to explore um, the idea of quality and authenticity, as well as, you know, the role of, you know, the commodification of 
emotions and emotional labor and service. These are huge topics that you're going to leave this conversation with, with a lot more perspective on. But um, to help us become a little bit more curious uh, as people to ask questions in a more sociological way when we make decisions as entrepreneurs, as people who currently exist in a system and have, will have impact on the future systems. Uh, so I'm really pleased to be able to uh, speak with Noah today and uh, present this conversation to you. So get your philosophical hats on, get your sociological hats on, um, get ready to go down some rabbit holes and think deeply about some of these things. Here now is my interview with Noah Berger. Noah, welcome to Keys to the Shop. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Excited to be here. I've heard so many great things about you from friends in the industry, and I'm fascinated by your field of study. Um, and this is going to be a really thought-provoking episode. And, I, and as we've been talking about this, and I've been trying to get like really like uh, yes and no answers and stuff from you uh, preparing for the episode the idea that we're going to have more questions than answers at the end of this has become apparent, which is great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really appreciate uh, someone in your position helping us just think through these types of issues more with your work. I wonder if we could start by talking about how you got into this field of study. Um, you're working on uh, the social construction of quality in French and Brazilian specialty coffee markets. That's a pretty uh, niche subject. And so <laughs> I wonder if we could start there. How did this all come about for you? Yeah, it is. It is pretty niche and at the same time, very large. Um, so what happened was I was doing my master's degree in anthropology in France on something completely different that has nothing to do with coffee, France or Brazil. I was studying like uh, demography in Japan. And when I finished my master's degree and I was looking for a new subject for my PhD, that I decided to pursue. And um, I stumbled upon an interesting funding opportunity to study the commodification of emotional experiences. So still in relation to, to coffee, friends, or Brazil at that point. Um, but as I started contemplating interesting subjects to kind of study this, um, this theme from, like how emotions become products, how emotions become commodities, basically, I thought about I thought about coffee and it started from the coffee shop because I'm from Tel Aviv and today I live in Paris and I really like spending my time in coffee shops. And I started from thinking, what does it mean um, to commodify an atmosphere, um, an ambience? What does it mean to go to a place and pay for the atmosphere, buy something there or go specifically there because it feels good? So it really started from this very specific question that I wanted to study. But then I started, I, I, I got the funding, started my PhD and started hanging out with uh, baristas and roasters in France and discovered this amazing, amazing world that is uh, the specialty coffee market. And as I was exploring it, I really felt like um, going beyond just this very specific question of the atmosphere of the coffee shop and decided to expand to the whole basically value chain. And not only to the whole value chain, but also to um, from just the atmosphere to the question of quality. So I decided to choose um, two places, France, where I was already doing my research, and Brazil, as an example of a producing country. And why I chose those two precisely is because they have something in common. Um, France is a country or specifically Paris, known for a coffee culture, right? Like Paris is the city of cafes. But in the specialty coffee market, it's also known, um, let's say, for not having the best coffee in the world, right? There are all these articles mm. um, <laughs> like asking, why is coffee in Paris so bad? Um, and something similar um, happens in Brazil, that is the world's largest producer and exporter of coffee, but again, in a specialty coffee market, doesn't have the reputation of producing, you know, the highest quality. So what I was interested in was what happens when this new movement, new market arrives in France and in Brazil and says, well, you guys, you, you don't know what's quality. Let us teach you. Let us show you how we can turn coffee from a basic commodity to 
uh, you know, a high end beverage. And, uh, and yeah, how this process works, how basically the idea of quality is constructed, how it takes into account existing local traditions, for example, how the dialogue or, you know, the negotiation with local culture takes place. So that's how, uh, that's how I got to where I am uh, today with this. Wow, that is just a lot of deep thinking on <laughs> uh, something. <laughs> when we open, a, yeah, we open a coffee shop, we are considering the atmosphere. We, we, we want to consider it for a little bit of time and then be like, well, this is, this is my atmosphere and then I'm going to forget about it. But we don't really think about the deeper impact of it on society and, and culture, the way that you're diving into it. Um, it, it seems like, uh, there is a, a war between that new way of doing it that p almost like passes a judgment on the old way and the, the tension of trying to keep the traditions versus the, the new, uh, approach would be something that, um, creates a lot of tension within that culture, uh, within like, like Paris, for example, like imagine people are just even more, you know, uh, likely to double down on the, the cafe and reject a new way of doing it in order to protect the tradition. Uh, what, what are the like fa more fascinating things that you've discovered about the impact of um, the aesthetics of the coffee bar and mm. sort of in the way that we signal uh, society, like the way that we signal quality to the, the greater community that we're in? Well, the the thing with aesthetics, again, it, the pre preoccupation with uh, aesthetics or atmosphere of a coffee shop is not something that is new. I'm looking at it more as how aesthetics are used to, again, to construct quality. Um, so the case of France is indeed very interesting because you have the traditional Parisian cafe, right, that has a very, um, very kind of um, iconic look or iconic aesthetic that has been shaped over the course of a hundred centuries basically the fusion of this kind of more working class um revolutionary look and this more elite um luxury feel to it that you know kind of make what it is the what is the parisian cafe and then when a say a a special coffee shop opens shop in paris then generally speaking it's it's still considered to be a very Anglo movement, right? I mean, specialty coffee um, started kind of forming in the United States, then in Australia, and in Paris, it's still perceived that way, less and less so. So these shops also have kind of a look and a vibe associated to them. Um, we describe it as Scandi, we describe it sometimes as Brooklyn, as Melbourne, I don't know, something more, mm. um, you know, white, clean, maybe <laughs> tropical minimal. plants, maybe wooden floors. Uh, the menu will be different as well. You'll have more muffins and scones and avocado toasts than, for example, like a cheap croissant. So it's questions that I think are interesting. When you make a choice to open a specialty coffee shop, do you go with this design or do you try more to connect with this more traditional look? And now this is quite obvious, but at the same time, it's it's important and more complex than you know what first appears maybe because when you make these choices of how you're going to design your shop you're opening or closing your space symbolically to people who are going to feel more comfortable going in there um now a lot of times when i say this then people reply like yeah yeah like we we all these like coffee shops that look alike the the brooklyn the scandy that's so boring no no i think that serves a point i mean especially in the first years of a new industry, you have to signal to consumers somehow that this is a place that gives them what they're looking for, right? Because say you're going to a new city and you don't really, you don't have a lot of recommendations and you're just looking for a place where you want to get good coffee. How are you going to know from the hundreds of choices that you have that this is the one serving what you've been looking for? The coffee that you've had a few years ago in Melbourne and you're trying to find that same experience or vibe. It's through design. So doing this kind of um, look that might resemble other coffee shops for me does make sense, especially in the beginning. Um, it also is, I mean, the way these coffee shops are often designed is is supposed to, again, uh, emphasis not 
so much the place, but more the product. It kind of conveys the idea that this place is clean because the focus is coffee or this place is clean because we have, we're selling something that's you know clean that's worked that's refined that's standardized but at the same time as a specialty coffee market kind of um, implements itself in a local culture especially in places like France or Italy and if it wants to expand then what you see is that some of them are starting to dialogue or take inspiration from the more traditional aesthetics so you have roasters buying old bistros or old Parisian coffee shops and serving specialty coffee in them, you know, or mm. just taking small elements to make people that are not familiar with specialty coffee feel more comfortable, feel more at ease, um, get the, the signal that, oh, okay, this, this place is open for us as well. It's something that we know, but at the same time, a little bit new. Is that a result of, or, or is this something that is happening as a reaction against the, uh, we'll use Paris as an example because that's what we're talking about, kind of. Um, you know, the knowledge that, you know, the coffee wasn't of the greatest quality, although the atmosphere was really uh, deep and there was a soul-satisfying thing about being in that atmosphere, but the palate wasn't so satisfied. So it, it seems like people would, based on what you're saying, it's signal that this is a place that focuses on coffee. I love that that perspective that this is clean because we're focused uh, but then you have people sort of going back into accepting more traditional looks. Is is that a balanced perspective now that they've had their time to sort of, um, I don't want to say re-educate, but be, make people more familiar with what a higher-end coffee experience is like? It seems like that first initial like modern coffee bar reaction to the traditional one would be um a not an overreaction but just a kind of a knee-jerk like no we're going to do everything different so that you're absolutely sure that this is the place to get great coffee and now that you're sure we're going to introduce more traditional stuff because we feel that's safe and not confusing yeah i th i mean there's some of that although again i don't think it's a very you can draw a perfect and straight line of progression it's not like from in the beginning, everyone just did scan the Anglo look and today people are doing something more hybrid. I think from the very beginning of the specialty coffee market in France, you had people um, taking this into account. So you had roasters um, c clearly taking inspiration from the wine world. That is, you know, uh, a big <laughs> in France, obviously, big part of their tradition. Um, you had people kind of taking inspiration from the traditional Parisian cafe. So people had this in mind from the very beginning, um, but maybe now have more confidence of taking this, um, you know, further still. But but again, it's it's diversif. I mean, it's it's about diversification. So at the same time that you're having people going more and more towards this dialogue or hybrid or tradition, you also have other people that are pushing it to the other extreme still because precisely because you've built a customer base of people who know now what specialty coffee is and again this is mainly paris right it's it, it doesn't apply so much to other cities at that point um, at this point a little bit but mostly paris so once you've had this you know customer bases of people that know what it is you can also dial it up on the clean um kind of uh, focus the aesthetic as well and you see that too coffee shops that are you know just completely white and are offering very expensive um, coffee with, you know, Japanese menu names and something that is is far from um, approachable, but they can afford to do that because they know that there are people looking for that too. So you have all of these things happening at the same time. When a market expands, there is more diversity. So you'll see more of everything, basically. Yeah. Um, I, I admit that I'm somebody who... I may be because I'm older, but I, I have a soft spot for a more traditional cafe, and I, I like the idea of them serving great coffee. When I see the modern version of cafes where it is that white box with an exclusive menu and a four-ounce cup for you know $20, um, that to me, I see a place for that, but it, I don't enjoy it as much as the idea of a traditional cafe and and i think i'm making a judgment call there i'm making a quality assessment in that i'm maybe favoring my um 
the third place idea or the need for some kind of social place that the coffee shop serves for me. Um, mm. In your research, I wonder what kind of impact have you seen this move to the more modern expression of cafes where, as you said, it's not as accessible. And we do see there's a lot more accessibility being focused on in specialty coffee by the coffees we roast and the ways that we do hospitality, et cetera. Um, I, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how you see the impact of that kind of schism happening right now. Again, uh, as the market grows, there's more of everything. I wouldn't, from my own observations, but again, I don't have a, um, a world view on this. I'm focused in, on Paris and I know a few other cities, but you really get more of both, meaning you have, um, you have uh, everything dialed to the extreme. So you have places that do the accessibility to the extreme and really put a focus on, 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 on serving as simple or simplified. You have coffee companies, for example, uh, deciding that they don't want to do tasting notes anymore, that they just want to, you know, invent their own criteria that is more approachable and speaks more to people that are not in the industry. Um, even not not so much talking about origins anymore, but just making places and packaging as well that is just is fun, is colorful, is a way again to to to, to reach a larger audience and make it more accessible. And but at the same time, you also have people that want to focus more on the on the product and and because i mean eventually what everyone wants or what everyone says they want is to you know make higher margins and not just because they want to you know for for their own sustainability but because uh for for reasons or motivations or farmer sustainability as well but even in that you have different ways of achieving that right because sustainability for a farmer for example is increasing can be increasing prices, like selling less for more or increasing volumes as well because farmers need to sell everything. So in the coffee shop, it's the same thing. Do you increase volumes, keeping the prices relatively down and the approach more accessible and simplified and, and make it about you know a fun experience? Or do you convince people that they need to pay much more and consume less and that can come with great service as well, but maybe just less approachable. What do you think people are paying a lot more money for? Is it because you were talking about the experience and commodification yeah. of an experience and a and a and of emotions that are involved? Because kind of emotion is inextricable from an experience because you want to feel good about your purchase, right? Um, and right. Like you've invested something into this, and. Um, there's, I guess, two schools here. Like there's the quality of the coffee and the nuances, um, sort of the, you know, are you getting all your flavor notes to the judges? Could they taste it all? <laughs> and then there's the way you feel from the service and the emotional labor that goes into that. So there's, are, are we paying more for are, are the emotional labor and the, um, the experience or is it just truly the coffee flavor itself? I, I don't, th I think very few customers um, pay for the, just for the quality in the cup. Otherwise they wouldn't be, I mean, we're talking about customers, especially customers who go to the coffee shop to consume. Otherwise they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't need to go there at all. Um, I think what customers pay for, of course, part of it is, is quality. I'm not, I don't mean to say that there is nothing in the cup that justifies a price, um, especially on the buying end. I mean, you, you attach, uh, you know, a certain price to certain qualities in the cup, complexity, et cetera. But from the consumer side, it can be the atmosphere that you're paying a little bit more for. I want to pay more because this place uh, is, is fun. It makes me feel good. It can be also identity in the sense of a match. Like I want to buy this product because it, reaffirms the idea of myself that I want to have. So that can be that coffee was produced ethically. Now, mo most consumers, they're told that the product that they're buying is being, you know, produced ethically, uh, sourced, you know, uh, fair trade or direct trade or whatnot, but they don't really know it. I mean, no one goes almost and verifies these things. It will be more and more common maybe with traceability and 
different technologies, but most people, they, they pay for the idea that they consume ethically or that, um, you know, they're, they consume something that has labor put into it, uh, meaning, intent. So a lot of it is about how it makes you feel or how it makes you think about yourself or how it matches your taste or how it matches your perception of yourself. And that's kind of what we mean also when we talk about commodifying these things. Like you put a price on, on an experience that you're trying to purchase, on an idea, on, on an identity. And the emotional labor thing is, is something different. The emotional labor basically um, is the idea that you put a price or extract financial value from work that is emotional expression. So service, for example. Um, when you pay a waiter a tip because that waiter was nice and smiled and you felt like, you know, put an extra effort in their work, then that is basically emotional labor. <laughs> you know, tips basically are emotional labor. Mm -hmm. um, when you go on a flight and, you're, and you expect your flight attendant to be, to again, be positive, to smile, uh, everything that she does that is not just doing what she's supposed to do as a flight attendant, which is, I don't know, serve the drinks, uh, make sure that everyone's secure, uh, you know, everyone has their seat belts on, everything else that a, a waiter, a service person does extra, basically, is that. So, yeah. It feels like the same thing as when we're signaling that we're a different coffee shop because we bought this machine or we have this aesthetic. And now you don't necessarily know because anybody can buy all that. Um, and you can do that in a performative way. And n now the, the, the experience doesn't necessarily lie. So it, it feels like the commodification of emotion is like the ultimate differentiator at the moment because with so much funding behind coffee shops, we have you know, anybody can purchase the latest La Marsoco and, you know, source the amazing coffees, but not everybody can have a staff that goes above and beyond, but it comes at some, somewhat of a um, uh, emotional price tag. Yes, exactly. That's, that's a great point because, I mean, all these things about the um, commodification of emotions, the emotional labor, the experiences, they're all extras, right? Because we're talking about consumption here that is not, we don't need to buy this coffee. I mean, we need it to, to wake up maybe, but our consumption choices for most things we buy today are driven by, um, I mean, it does this product correspond more to my identity, to the experience that I'm looking for, because you have choice in everything, right? But that's an interesting point on a more, on a, on a larger level still, because as, as things have become more accessible to us, our, the way the way we consume and the way we differentiate from one another or between different people and goods has changed as well. I think specialty coffee is, is a very interesting case of this because um, think, okay, think about the difference between uh, luxury and, and specialty products, for example. Um, up until the early 20th century or mid 20th century, more or less, you could distinguish between different goods by their price, basically. Luxury goods would be more expensive and there was an identity component involved as well. Like I'm buying something more expensive, I have something to spare. But in the age that we live in today, a lot of luxury goods have become either very accessible or good enough copies are existing. So we've developed a lot of new ways to distinguish between different products, between different goods. Um, part is like the experience that you craft around them. And another one is the information and the education that you need to access them. And that's what I think a specialty market is. It's goods. It doesn't just come with um, an experience because luxury goods do that as well. But you need kind of knowledge. You need time and you need experience to understand them or to enjoy them, um, to understand what does the terroir of Yiger Chafe region in Ethiopia tastes like, um, what is the direct trading model, and, and the fact that uh, there is no label on a specialty coffee package is actually a good thing because it means that it was actually traded more fairly than a label that says fair trade so i think it's a yeah it's a great point like you have all these new ways to tell goods apart through experiences through emotional labor through again information and education and time that is invested 
in those goods. Basically. And there's also also the problem of uh, authenticity, of of what's uh, authentically experienced versus the thing that you know somebody just bought in a box. Like here's a coffee shop in a box, and it has all the modern trappings of that Scandinavian coffee bar you love with the succulents in the window. Um, and yeah. <laughs> you know, or and then here's one that has a little bit more of that. Um, nuance of human connection and, and thoughtfulness that's not just a plug and play. It, 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 I guess this is hard because, you know, yourself as a sociologist, you, you're looking at this, there's there's always a lot more questions here, like what is authentic, what is quality, and um, do we run the risk of sort of um, losing uh, as businesses when we don't react by purchasing that, that shop in a box by, you know, we're not buying the signal that we're, we're better. We're taking our time to distinguish ourselves, but maybe we're losing market share while we're doing that. Um, like how do you, pers- how do you pursue the idea of authenticity when you're studying these markets? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not exactly going to answer your question because my perspective as a sociologist on this question is, is very, is very different. It's not about the gap between what is real and what is false. Um, I think the question of authenticity is incredible because we are, we are living in a time where we were just obsessed with the idea of authenticity. But for me, as a sociologist, authenticity means nothing. It doesn't mean anything because it means everything, anything and anyone can be qualified as authentic under certain circumstances. Because if you think about it, when, when you just say the word authentic out of the top of your head, most people, I think, have this image of like, you know, local, artisanal, unique, traditional. But when you really start looking into it, as a lot of sociologists and historians have, you see that it can mean so much more. Um, for example, uh, researchers have shown that um, even even brands and products like McDonald's, KFC, and Vegemite that are produced industrially at scale, that are the furthest away from their um, quote unquote nature as possible can be qualified as authentic under certain conditions. Um, for example, uh, certain people, again, f- to, to, to uh, North Americans listening, that this might sound maybe weird, maybe it applies outside of the States, but someone, for example, might go to a trip around Southern United States and he m- might, for example, choose to consume fast food as part of the experience of, um, of Southern United States, for example. Because authentic is not just about the natural the the source the root but it can be about tradition as well authenticity can be nature in a sense something that is close to its origin to its nature and it can also be about culture about tradition something that corresponds to a tradition that we've defined for it so in that sense for example mcdonald's can be authentically american and vegemite can be considered authentically australian because it's perceived by some people to represent popular australian culture you know, so when you really start looking into these things, you see that it quickly is emptied of meaning. Um, easier examples to understand would just be foods that we think of as completely authentic, but of course, their ingredients are, you know, originate from from places that have nothing to do. For example, um, the Vietnamese dish bo bun. Uh, it's a dish of um, rice noodles and uh, beef that's considered to like represent Vietnamese cuisine in the world but it didn't even exist before French colonialists you know because beef wasn't eaten in Vietnam before French colonialism it was a you know was used for labor Um, again you know more common examples like uh, uh, tomatoes in Italy that only were imported from Peru so when you talk about like authentic in in food like where do you start what does that mean and i think in coming back to coffee because i strayed very far very far away um in specialty coffee there is also a a preoccupation with authenticity but here again it can mean very different things um you have authentic in the sense of an emotional experience and meaning 
that's kind of what you were saying, um, to go to a coffee shop and feel that it's coherent and feel that it's real, um, that the coffee kind of evokes memories and, and emotions in you, these kind of things. At the same time, authenticity can be about the origin of the coffee, um, you know, to taste the, the taste of the land, what, what's called in French, terroir, um, the, um, the, to know that uh, this coffee is supposed to taste uh, floral because it came from Ethiopia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you have also authenticity in a new sense, in a different sense, that's a coffee that's authentified. And that's very different than the other senses, meaning, for example, again, transparency and traceability. It's not talking about, um, I don't know, the, the origin so much, not representing the authenticity of coffee through images of producers, but to talk about numbers. This is how much I pay. So you have the idea of authenticity kind of um, in many different meanings or ways, even in that you know, niche industry. So what do you actually talk about when you're talking about authenticity? Is it some of those things? Is it all of them? Some of them are contradicting. Like maybe authentic coffee for you is a coffee that you can objectively measure its qualities or how much it was paid for. Maybe it's just an emotional experience that's very vague. Um, maybe it's the face of a producer. Maybe that's fake. You know, it's mm. really complex. It, man, it, it really almost seems to me that it's um, that we already know in a sense that it doesn't mean anything, even when we use it in earnest, that we, we kind of know that there are some in our mind, whatever context it is in, it gets, it, it, there's a compromise here. We're using it as a marketing term to pull on the heartstrings of the customer so that they come in to get that experience. So we're almost subconsciously aware that authenticity of a, you know, maybe not the, the best cuisine in, according to a Michelin star chef, but an authentic Chicago hot dog might be to somebody else worth paying a lot of money for because of the experience. But um, we know that, you know, authentic is is sort of riddled with a lot of holes, like all the holes you just poked in it. <laughs> yeah, I feel, yeah, yeah, I feel like people are, are always a, kind of half aware of this. Um, and but at the same time, no one I, I think most people don't use it like as a, as a conscious manipulation either. Like no one's outside of this. Like I always I look for like, a, quote unquote, authentic uh, ethnic restaurants myself or places that feel, quote unquote, real when I travel. You know, I, I'm not living outside of this either. Um, and we're all kind of aware of it. But it's it makes sense that in a world that has so much industrialization, digitalization, links between the consumption and the production sphere that are a rupture that we would we would look for you know some connections or emotional connections with the products that we consume and and like chasing after authenticity is not just a bad marketing thing to be interested in the origin of where your food came from um to know that it was produced ethically um to learn something through tasting are great great things you know so I'm I'm not, I mean, I'm very critical of this notion, but I'm critical of, um, of, of, um, of the, I don't know, of the illusion of it. But again, it can be a good motor as well. So here's a question. What kind of, what benefit is there to becoming hyper aware of the illusion of authenticity? by asking questions about the construct of something that we can't necessarily escape. Um, as, let's say, um, coffee shop owners, people that are going to start a, a chain of events that will signify a ton of these confusing things to people, like, this is our coffee bar, here's where we get it, here's what it means to our community, there's so much involved there. What, what benefit is there to really diving into that and, and how it impacts your decisions? Well. I would say there's a part of it that our sociology is a little frustrating because we criticize and deconstruct everything and we don't offer necessarily answers. That said, I do think that there is some practicality to doing this. Um, one would be because it helps you make more conscious choices and more precise conscious uh, choices as, as a retailer, for example. 
um, once you understand that there are different meanings or significations to a term like authenticity, then you can choose to use it in a way that is uh, more coherent with the concept that you're trying to bring forward and, and understand who you're pushing away and who you're bringing in by using this or this type of authenticity. For example, uh, sociological research has shown that natural authenticity, meaning highlighting the origin, the provenance of products, is often tied together with higher prices and with complicated language. So, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about high-end restaurants that would have like really a lot of uh, raw ingredients, natural ones, but also very high prices in like, uh, you know, cooking terms from Japanese, Italian and French, thus rendering access to this kind of authenticity less accessible. While products and places that are more affordable usually talk more about traditional authenticity or cultural authenticity, meaning this is a hundred years old recipe, we have long held traditions, and this often is more accessible to, to you know, larger, you know, crowds with less means, not just money, but also um, education, for example. So when you understand these things, when you understand the social uh, meaning of the word choices and branding choices that you make, I think that's valuable to be able to make a choice. And the other thing on a more personal level where I think it's useful, it's just to get people off their horses a little bit. Like you get to make your choices. <laughs> and I mean, all choices are valid and good. That's why I don't, I don't think like the a traditional cafe is better than uh, an Anglo cafe or this vice versa, you know? There are no good or bad choices. So make your choice and don't, don't be condescending over those that make different choices. Don't rule out different choices because there, there, you know, there's choices and, and logic in those choices as well. Um, yeah, no, that's a great point. So that's kind of a arrogance deconstruction for me. <laughs> oh man, that's that's helpful for me too because I'm a very opinionated person. I, I, you know, I have a podcast also, and so that's huh. that maybe a sign. But yeah, I, I have opinions, but I separate yeah. them. You know, I separate my personal opinions from my work. Exactly, <laughs> and and you know, coming down on. You know, oh, these kids with their, you know, fill in the blank and um, <laughs> whatever new thing I like to, you know, be a curmudgeon about. Um, it's, it's helpful to hear like, yeah, this is in, con in context a, a equally valuable thing based on the people who value it, who, who kind of generate that. Um, and I like what you said there. I thought it was fascinating to say, you know, you're going to uh, make something accessible to one group of people, but you're going to push other people away. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it seems pretty helpful to understand when the conversation that we're currently in has a lot to do with how to uh, widen our appeal to markets and get more coffee purchased and help, you know, create more sustainability in the market through accessibility. Yet still, we're going to make our decisions to push people away and maybe even feel guilty about it unless we're kind of doing these kind of exercises that you're demonstrating now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, whichever choice you make, you push people away. The question is um, how many numbers, who, which parts of the population, because the basis of consumption uh, in, in, in the neoliberal um, economy that we live in is separating between things. Things always come on the expense of, of others. Like there's no way to include everyone, um, but you can definitely, um, yeah, you can definitely make choices that speak to different groups or different populations. Or again, there is there is value or there is some sense between the approach of, of doing something that's larger volume, um, because also from the, the farmer perspective, but also in valuing the product and making people understand that they need to, this is something they need to pay more for. Mm -hmm. And I think both are helping in the end. They're competing, but at the same time helping each other out because those that are increasing the prices um, for coffee are, are having people maybe have a new appreciation for this product. And those that are making it more accessible to larger crowds are, you know, getting the idea of it um, to, yeah, to a larger crowd. So you kind of need both in a way. Yeah, I love that because one is not going to stand out unless it's in contrast with another, right? Right, and you, um, yeah, you you see this, for example, uh, I'm in Israel now, where I'm from, and 
for example, Starbucks um, didn't uh, never never really succeeded in Israel. They're gonna open open shop here again, but it it is felt. I mean, the specialty coffee market here I had a hard time catching on because what, for example, Starbucks did um, in a lot of other countries where they did catch on is they got people used to paying more for coffee. Um, and they, you know, they, they spread the word of, of quote unquote specialty coffee uh, to larger audiences. So you, you need these things to kind of, you know, build up a market, for example, the specialty coffee market. Um, yeah. And then these choices happen again. Do you expand? Do you privilege mm-hmm. quality, prices, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and you have to make a decision at some point. You can't, you, you just need to go forward. I and... mean, yeah, everyone, yeah, everyone does a balance in the end. Yeah. No one does just this or that, right? But you, yeah, you make some choices. Exactly. Sure. Um, something that we were talking about earlier in terms of emotional labor, when we're asking, you know, uh, we're talking about the flight attendant or the barista in this case, to no matter what's happening at home or in their personal life or whatever, they're going to smile, they're going to, you know, give good service. And there's a, you know, ex- expectation in service that that's just kind of part and parcel with what we do. Um, and it, I wonder if there's, uh, what your perspective is on this, because uh, there's a part of emotional labor, I think, that we make customers do too. Um, and therefore, as a reciprocal uh, action, they expect from us emotional labor. And that emotional labor seems to me to be the idea that it, we're not actually trying to guilt them into paying more for coffee or buying only fair trade or you know, coming to our uh, class about cupping and stuff, but we're kind of suggesting that you should feel bad for not wanting to pay more for coffee. And, and I think from a consumer level, we, we, we see that in the way that people purchase. That's just my opinion or what I see. I wonder if uh, you maybe could give what you see about that. Is, is there some correlation? Uh, I wouldn't say that what you described on the consumer end is emotional labor. Um, I mean, there is use of emotions there in a, in a, in a transaction in the way that, yeah, um, um, pushing people to buy out of guilt, though I'm not sure that's exactly what's happening in specialty coffee. I think it's more motivating people. Um, it can be It can be motivating through pity, maybe, but more out of the good feeling that you get um, of doing something ethical, right? like a correcting a wrong rather than feeling guilty. Though, again, that's not emotional labor for me. Emotional labor is when you put financial value on emotions as part of work. It's really emotions as part of work. And in the context of, of um, service industry, as you said, it's it's complicated because of course we all want to go to a place and be served well and be served with a smile and you know also having worked in the like in different um uh, culinary industries um it's something that that you know gives you pleasure to do be nice and smile i don't think that people shouldn't but the problematic aspect of it is that you people just forget that it's work you know people Mm -hmm. just forget that it's work and it can be pretty discriminatory as well in the sense that it's not just being nice it's being nice or polite in a certain way and not everyone has the same access to these kind of codes or behaviors Um, and no not everyone is expected of the same level or kind of nice behavior Um, I don't know any specific research about this in coffee though I think Sabine Parrish talked about this a little in her master's degree Mm -hmm. um but I know that flight attendants, for example, there, there was work about the emotional labor of flight attendants that shows very clearly that people expect female flight attendants to smile much more than male ones. I mean, maybe maybe some of you will recognize this from personal experiences, especially having worked behind the bar. But as a woman, you'd be much more criticized if you don't smile compared to a man usually. Um, that's expressed also through tipping. And, and again, the practice of tipping is is problematic is problematic in that sense because tipping is giving people money according to how nice they were <laughs> basically sure and yeah and that's 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 a lot of work and not everyone not everyone grows up in an environment where they learn how to smile how to be polite in a way that caters to consumers expectations 
Um, so just, yeah, keep that in mind, I guess. It always reminds me of the double standard that um, has existed and is being worked on, uh, not existing in competitions for uh, female competitors are not allowed as much uh, seriousness and stoicism as the male counterparts, right? Um, and been docked, famously docked uh, points for such, you know, you know, daring to not, you know, perform a, a certain way. Um, and, you know, as a longtime coffee professional, I can definitely see that I'm allowed a lot more leeway when it comes to my display of emotions behind the bar, um, you know, as a, as a man. So that uh, it resonates greatly. And certainly I think with much of the audience, um, and this extends also to the farm and how when we're bringing in the uh, the origin as a, you know, back to our talk about authenticity as a point of saying, hey, here's the farmer who we uh, got the coffee from and we create a financial incentive for people to purchase it based on the image. Um, there, there's a part of uh, what we expect from farms and you, you talk about this that is yeah. just the same kind of emotional labor as we expect from uh, service professionals. I wonder if you could elaborate on that just a, a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, in this sense, it's interesting because there's something that connects baristas and, and farmers in that sense that we expect them. Um, yeah, we expect both in some sense uh, to perform emotionally, uh, to perform, you know, creativity and authenticity. And I think also derive like they part of the pleasure that you derive as a barista is like this kind of performance or interaction with the client and i think i mean that kind of also compensates in a way for the really low salaries that um baristas make and that um and that uh, farmers of course as well now on the farmer side again people tend to talk about farmers as if they were um you know this one thing it's it's you know there are so many different origins and, and, and just people with different preferences, but it, it is something that I've noticed with some of the farms I visited in Brazil is that certain buyers, when they go buy a coffee for, I mean, especially coffee is often described as like relationship coffee, right? So you don't just buy a coffee just because of the score, but you buy from people you like working with. Now that's, of course, there's nothing bad in that. On the contrary, it's, it's a great thing to, to, you know, relationships but what I didn't notice and have been described to me as well by some of the farmers I've seen is that there is this expectation from some of them to again always be happy always put on a happy a happy face um, put a lot of, of again emotional work and investment into the hosting experiences um, we, we don't think about it when we go to origin so much but a lot of these farmers like they have to take their all of their weekends off uh, during harvest and some of them all 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 year round um, their evenings off sometimes they have like kind of visitor centers that are in their homes and again it's not like you know it's it's their choice as well they they take pleasure from it as well but it, it does have a cost and I saw and heard some of them being very wound down basically by how much they had to always keep a happy face and and there is there is also the sense that if if you'll frown or if you want to be nice enough, then, you know, some of your buyers that are not longtime friends might abandon you and go for someone else who is a better host, who takes more of his time, who puts mm. more of himself for himself. I've heard this from exporters as well. Like, and again, I'm not, it's not black or white. Like, it's completely understandable that an exporter would prefer to work with people who he feels are nice and good partners and he can trust. But on the producer side, it can put quite a lot of pressure. And what I've heard some of them say is that um, it doesn't always work the other way around. Those of, the, those of them that could afford to go, for example, visit, um, I don't know, European or North American markets, roasters don't always host them the same way they would. They expect to be hosted. Like they'll give them like a map or a list of recommendations to be like, okay, good luck. See you, <laughs> see you next week. Enjoy the weekend. Well, the other way around, you know, you're a buyer and you go on a farm and you have nothing else to do. So of course you'd expect um, the the producer to take you around with his car and spend all the weekend with you, et cetera, et cetera. So just again, I'm not necessarily just. Um, flat out criticizing this notion of relationships it's great um but just 
be mindful of what it means for what it might mean for the producer and what we expect of him or her and how we make them feel about it and again if we're going to someone's house and they're doing all of this for us at the bare minimum also you can at least do the same um, and express interest and curiosity in their lives as well that's just always nice as a human being because mm. that's not something that always happens that I've haven't that I've seen not always happening as well with buyers uh, yeah it's kind of a heavy thing to think about um, considering their circumstance versus ours and um, you're words uh, saying mindfulness and curiosity those two words to me seem like a, a overarching theme here where instead of just taking something at face value it's helpful to investigate for uh, us to investigate our place in the market and yeah. our impact on the people that we serve like a owner will need to have you know a lot of different questions they ask about how they're impacting the lives of their baristas, the people who bring them their coffee, um, the customers that they serve. So a barista could ask a question of, you know, that's an empathetic, curious question about the customer as well as, you know, their coworkers. And it seems like, the you know, the crisis that we're dealing with right now and the questions we're asking ourselves about sustainability might have been asked before, might have been dealt with sooner, had there been more honesty and less covering up with smiles from farmers, baristas, with people felt safe to express like, hey, this is really sucks. <laughs> this is terrible. And we, oh, geez, I didn't know it was that bad, you know, and we're, we're led to believe that things are much better because people are performing a certain way. Yeah, I have two things about this. The first one is that, sure, like empathy and just being, again, mindful of who exactly you're interacting with whether it's on the farm side or on the consumer side. On the farm side, it's remembering that each producer you're interacting with is a different person with different needs. Um, and just to try to take the, the time to just understand, you know, the person in front of you, same uh, as, as a retailer, like understand who's your audience and how you're talking to them exactly and how that makes them feel. Not in like their, you know, their sensitive inner self, but they feel excluded, included in the way you communicate with them. But I do at the same time, I, I wouldn't put all the um, I wouldn't put the blame on the you know dire situation in the market because that's something else that happens in the neoliberal economy. It's the shifting of responsibility uh, to the individual from the market and from the state. It's the idea that um, um, we are the sole responsible ones for our own happiness and our own health and our own well-being. Um, that if we're suffering, if something's not going well, then we must have done something wrong that we should resolve through therapy, for example. Um, we, we talk about this like uh, manufacturing, you know, happy selves. Um, and that's that's a problem as well. I mean, <laughs> uh, sure, by by performing and, and, and acting happy, we're covering up um, or ignoring some day-to-day -day wrongs, but there are, you know, profound... Um, structural um, reasons for the for the price crisis and many other things that are quote unquote wrong today in our societies mm -hmm. um, that could only be fixed by very large scale solutions and that are not fixed because of geopolitical interests um, because of market interests because the government uh, or governments are not doing their job um, because the market is skewed in a way that um, you know that makes makes things the way they are. So I wouldn't put the blame on individuals either in this case. Um, mm. Yeah, and shift it back to to the structure. Right. Well, in that sense, I guess what my my thought was that you know you had, do have these structures of expectations where people feel the pressure to act a certain way to take advantage of what they perceive as. I want to be able to participate in what I see as the current structure, so I need to dance according to that tune. Um, so I need to fill, you know, fill in the blank. It's it's as a barista or as or as a farmer or whatever. If those structures were different, like what you're saying, if the structures allowed for more honesty, if they allowed, you know, we're trying to change these now for more transparency, for example. Um, so that you can know, we talk about this on the show 
with communication in the coffee shop? Like, is your coffee shop a safe place for honest communication between baristas and people who have power in the coffee shop? Because people oftentimes don't feel that that's the case. Um, and so they just don't say anything and they end up burning out or, you know, they leave. And so it seems like, yes, you know, what you're saying is absolutely 100% true. Like the systems, cre- you know, they seem to create this pressure that where people want to um, do things to get ahead, you know, get what they need. They want to survive, and so they just do what's needed. And so the systems, 100% agree, need to be changed to allow for more uh, honesty. Yeah, you're talking about more like normative systems that need to be changed. I, I mean, I think that's again that's part of the. Um, there, there are things that are more core than that. It's not just the the normative expectations. I mean, we all operate according to norms, and if I don't think we can strive for achieve. Uh, full honesty with no performance and no normative behavior and and that's okay because that's part of you know living in a human society and that's again part of the idealization of authenticity to strive always for realness and honesty i don't think that's possible Mm. um i'm talking more about really like um financial um structures uh policy you know things that are very (laughs) um uh, financial systems, economic systems that we can change through regulation, for example, much like a lot of the problems that we're seeing around the environment. So, I mean, it is happening, obviously, in the coffee market. People are talking about these things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm <laughs> I'm contradicting myself because I'm having all of this discussion uh, as a sociologist about norms and modes of expression. But in the end, I mean, behind all of those, there are um, they're all like embedded in, in structural governmental market uh, systems and and nothing as much as we strive for honesty and transparency in the way we express and talk about these ideas it's very important in our daily lives but on a deeper level it's yeah it, it, things have to go through a more systematic approach i think as well well in all of this uh we have covered uh, such a broad range of topics and um, yeah. It, it kind of makes the head spin, honestly, because these things aren't simple. Um, it, our existence in this ever connected world of of specialty coffee is not simple. Um, and I feel like your approach in sociology, as you study these things, is a very helpful one to kind of adopt. You know, we're not going to all you know get involved in a phd program to <laughs> study yeah. what you're studying i don't recommend it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we can adopt a certain kind of modes of thinking and questioning uh to help us make better decisions and so i i wonder as we wrap up here how can we ask questions kind of like you're doing that will help us make decisions that are a little bit more um thought through and um I want to say sustainable, but generally will kind of tick the boxes for value as our context determines is what's valuable. How can we be kind of crack sociologists here? Well, I guess the simplest thing to do is is just start by asking yourself, um, why am I making the choices that I'm making? Uh, not just try to make the best choice, but to think uh, what kind of, you know, um, chain of choices or what kind of concept of choices am I making in the way I design, interact um, with with people, be them producers or clients or whatever. And how do this, uh, how do these choices fit into something bigger? Um, what, um, you know, who, who am I talking to? What do they need? How will that make them feel? So that's like the, the, the most basic of the basic. But if you really want to expand um, that into a larger perspective, then I think it's always interesting and nice to read about, for example, the, the history of the field that you're in um, to get a more, you know, get things in, in perspective to see that things are in the end uh, relative and not so fixed and that you have all legitimacy to make a choice and stand behind it, but it, it's always a choice and it all, like always has uh, context and it always has consequences so if you want to go further just start by you know reading books about the history of food there are amazing things that you can that you can read and that will really open your mind um, 
if you want to go further, then read a little about emotional labor, read about neoliberalism, for example. There are things that will blow your mind about um, authenticity, um, happiness, things like that. I, I have a whole list of readings that I would be happy to share. In fact, I even made a collaborative, um, not a collaborative, sorry, a shared list of references um, exactly for this purpose. So feel free to contact me and I'll send it to you. But yeah, even, even if you don't have time on your hands to do all that reading, just, just asking that question, um, yeah, already can make a small shift. Again, I'm, I'm, I don't have the presumption to, you know, uh, to, change, to change an industry or the world through sociological thinking, but even small shifts mean something, right? So mm. You've done a lot here in this conversation to help us kind of broaden our perspectives and uh, I absolutely encourage people to take you up on that to... Uh, contact her and you know i think we can you know, link to that in the show notes as well of this episode yeah. um make it accessible to people and uh this was just a great conversation noah i really appreciate you coming on the show and i appreciate the work you're doing um in the industry Thank for you. the industry it's so fascinating uh, where can people go to learn more about what you're writing what you're doing where you're speaking all that good stuff um, so first of all, thank you. It was a pleasure and thank you for so patiently listening to me go on and on in those rabbit holes. Um, if you want to hear uh, more of that, <laughs> maybe more, you know, shorter and more focused, I do publish regularly um, in coffee magazines. I write for Standard um, 25 magazine, which you can find online for free. Um, a few things coming out. I also try to speak re regularly in um, specialty coffee events. So I'll be hosting a panel at the Expo Portland, and we'll see about uh, World of Coffee if they, you know, if they accept my proposal. And uh, yeah, as long as I'm doing my PhD, at the very least, I'll, I'll keep on doing those things. You can also reach out to me on social media. I have uh, my own account that's under my name. And also a project that I'm doing that's called Stimuli, um, which is like a, basically a traveling event where uh, we bring uh, anthropological or historical content about food and we, we do it together with tastings. Um, so yeah, feel free to follow me, hit me up, write, and I'm always happy to share and talk more. Perfect. Thank you so much, Noah. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that episode, and I really feel that uh, exploring these things is just the tip of the iceberg. For most of us, I would say the best thing to do is to maybe explore some further reading. Uh, Noah has given us a great list to start with. I've linked to that in the show notes so that you can uh, just click and read very easily. I would encourage you to also uh, check out Noah's work in various coffee trade publications, uh, such as 25 Magazine from the SCA or uh, Standard Magazine. And also, if you have the ability to um, hear her speak and moderate a panel uh, over at the Expo in Portland coming up in April, please do that as well. And also, I want to say a huge thank you to Noah for taking the time to be on the show discussing these ideas. These are the kind of conversations that coffee shops inspire. These are kind of existential questions that we can ask ourselves. And I love that, you know, we get to talk about this on the show. You know, we can be very, very practical on this show. And I know that most of you love uh, Keys to the Shop because it offers a lot of tools and a lot of, you know, action points that you can take. And maybe you are, I won't say frustrated, but uh, at the end of this, you know, we might have more questions than answers. And that's kind of the point to, to, you know, stir up a curiosity and mode of thinking that allows us to move beyond what may be comfortable or convenient for us and discover something new and deeper uh, that's right in front of us, you know, in, in and of itself, that is a valuable tool to have. Uh, yeah, it's not like a three-step process to have quality. It's not, you know, an equation for being more authentic, uh, but it is an invitation to discover what those things mean in your context in this time that you exist as an entrepreneur, as a coffee retailer. How do you move forward in a more uh, informed way? Uh, this is one of the ways. 
If you want the transcript for this episode, you can go to keystotheshop.com and on that website, just fill out the contact information and click the box that says sign me up. You'll be signed up to receive the email that has the uh, transcripts as well as some bonus material and uh, the links that we have in the show notes also. And uh, yeah, it's as easy as filling that out. You'll also get some news about keys to the shop and new projects that we have coming up on the horizon. Now, if you want to email me and reach out, give me some feedback, questions, comments, or if you want to reach out and uh, talk about working with keys to the shop consulting to help you with your business and operations, just email chris at keys to the shop.com. Always love to hear from you. Look forward to talking with you. And with that, we have reached the end of the show. Thank you again. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.